Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive function. This podcast is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. So join us as we explore executive function and the science of learning. And now, here's your host, the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function. As you know, on this podcast, we have many goals, but mainly we are fueled by three important goals to explain what executive function is, what the role of prefrontal cortex is, and how does that all connect to self-actualization, where we can translate the research findings from neuroscience, psychology, anthropology, sociology, and many ologies into meaningful bits so that we can become better versions of ourselves. Second, we definitely want to find out uh, there is a human plight uh, where the current self and the future self are often disconnected. And every single thing we do now can help or hurt the future self. And hopefully we can engage more in the process of helping the future self. And lastly, um, maybe all the wisdom that you get from this po- th- uh, this podcast episodes from various experts, such as today's expert, uh, our playbook becomes thick and strong with ideas that can propel us uh, towards meaningful change. So as I was thinking about uh, today's guest, you know, while pursue, um, pursuing goals and personal missions, uh, we encounter roadblocks, um, sometimes small ones, but sometimes massive interruptions. Many of them may uh, not even be our fault. And, you know, what we are left to do is manage our emotions, our thoughts and actions by activating our executive function skills so that we can stay the course. And then it's safe to say that, you know, human striving contains this desire to search for meaning or higher purpose. So the goals are not just small and shallow, but they can be deep and profound. Um, but when life goes haywire and uh, when we encounter relent, uh, unrelenting hardship or injustices, uh, particularly unforeseen circumstances such as COVID-19, uh, uh, that causes a deep emotional hurt, suffering, even isolation. And many of the us turn inwards or towards higher power. And God and faith, we haven't talked a lot about that on this podcast, uh, but that may be a source of solace and comfort. So the question is, how do we really talk about that and uh, use that as a tool to help ourselves manage ourselves, manage our emotions? Uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce you to uh, my guest today. Uh, it is uh, Dr. Julie Exline. She's a professor in the Department of Psychological Sciences at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, by the way, that was one of my three universities I had gotten acceptance, but I went to OU, which is in your neighborhood. <laughs> um, her research centers on the interface of clinical, social, and personality psychology, uh, with a special focus on topics involving spirituality, religion, and existential concerns. Uh, She served as principal investigator on two projects funded by John Templeton Foundation, one on religious and spiritual struggles, and another on supernatural attributions, which is very interesting, her work in that area. Uh, She's a licensed clinical psychologist uh, in Ohio and has been certified as a spiritual director through Ignatian Spiritual Institute at John Carroll University. Uh, she's also a past president of Society for the Psychological Psychology of Religion and Spirituality. Um, so with great pleasure, uh, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So we do talk a lot about um, connection between executive function and all the inner um, troubles that we have when we uh, are not able to attain our goals or we uh, we are not able to manage to channel our attention or maybe even get lost in purpose. So before we dive into your expertise, can we take a minute to kind of talk a little bit about um, the concept of morality? And, uh, you know, executive function is very critical in development of moral um principles or, uh, you know, that self-regulation so that we are aligning ourselves uh, for fairness and justice and doing right by people. So do you have any thoughts about that? 
I think so much of morality is about, well, there's first of all a process of discernment of what do I think is right in a given situation? What are my guiding principles? What am I trying to uh, order my life around? Or what's the right choice in just this one situation? So deciding what is going to be the best can require a lot of executive skill just to sift through different uh, opinions, different sources of information, and kind of figure out where your source of moral uh, guidance is going to be coming from. Is it going to be coming from a sacred text? Is it coming from what someone else is telling you? Is it coming more from your own gut feeling or your past experience? And then there's the matter of just trying to keep track, keep on track with uh, whatever the moral choices that you're trying to face and whatever you're trying to do, which requires often a lot of self-regulation as we all try to do the right thing or pursue our goals in situations where it's very difficult. Uh, morality involves figuring out what our deepest values are, what's right and wrong, and then putting all that energy into pursuing those things. And then coping with our failures and the mistakes that we make, which is also often quite a challenge to be able to work through those things with ourselves and with others, of course. I think that's such a wonderful distinction uh, that you pointed out that uh, one self-regulation is doing right by self, but right by others, but not just in the moment, but really being aware of the consequences of the long-term consequences uh, and how it impacts not just self, but many other uh, others that we are involved in. And I like that one, your deepest values and second, uh, reconciling with the failures or poor judgment or doing wrong by other people. That also requires <laughs> a kind of realignment. So as you think about this continuum of morality, religion, uh, religious beliefs and spirituality, is there any connection between all three of them or an, or an overlap? Well, a lot of religion is about taking what people believe to be sacred or transcendent and figuring out how to share those things, those beliefs with other people. And once you get, once you have uh, maybe transcendent experiences that you're trying to explain, you try to put them in with a group and you start having values wrapped around them. It's like, you've got yourself a, you know, a religion. So with mm. religions, you not only have this focus on transcendent experiences, God, maybe the supernatural, but there's also usually a moral code of some type, often, often a very complex one, that's wrapped up as part of this shared community of belief within the religion. So you could have uh, your moral values playing out through a more personal form of spirituality as well. But if you're talking about religion, you know, an important distinction between uh, religion and spirituality is just that religion is like spirituality shared between a bunch of people. And, you know, mm. every time we get a bunch of people trying to agree on something, trying to decide who's in and who's out and what are the rules going to be. And that's why sometimes people get frustrated about religion with all the rules and regulations and the ideas about who's in this group and who, who's out of the group and I feel excluded. Well, it's because you've got a lot of people trying to agree on matters of like deep ultimate questions about the meaning of life and then a bunch of rules about how to live. So there's an awful lot of areas to, to agree on if that's going to work smoothly. And it often doesn't. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think that's <laughs> such a good uh, description of the tug there that you want to, transcend and yet follow rules, you know? <laughs> so, yes. um, so what are the, uh, some of the emotional benefits of, uh, uh, having such belief system or cultivating or belonging to uh, formal or informal groups where, uh, practices align you uh, with faith? Well, being part of a, a faith community of some type, I would say a primary benefit of it is that it, it brings social support into the picture that you don't always have with more private forms of spirituality. So when you're together with other people focusing on matters of ultimate importance, you have the support that comes from that community. So whether that's just 
going to services or having somebody that you might be able to call on if you were having a practical or a spiritual problem, you're, you're integrated into that community at some level. And then there are the benefits that could come from either religion or spirituality of just having this view of the world that helps you to make meaning from things. And also that might lead you in the direction of healthy choices and behaviors in some cases, like taking care of your body because of your spiritual or religious beliefs or your values. So I think a lot of benefits can come from private spirituality, just having this way of orienting your life in a way that makes sense to you and that fits with who you are and that might give you hope for the future, maybe even a life beyond this one or just sources of deep meaning in this life and deep connectedness. And religion can add that benefit of you go to services or, you know, you have groups of people that you're connecting with. And, you know, I've been uh, reading a lot and there's been a lot of conversations about, uh, you know, particularly during the pandemic and particularly raising children uh, or supporting education of children, that there's so much fear and so much stress. And I feel, um, you know, the emotional benefits that you just described can really impact uh, in reducing fear. Uh, and the ultimate fear of it all is death, right? <laughs> So also bringing hope that um, uh, we really don't know enough about uh, death and that can create stress, but also how do we stay hopeful when we are enduring challenges? Uh, is there any, um, any, any way we can think about this reduction of fear through faith and uh, that kind of uh, belief in the higher order? Yes. It's, it's not my main specialty area of research, but there is a, a large body of work on the relationship between religious involvement and health and between spirituality and health. And that includes mental health and well-being. So there's certainly a lot of literature suggesting that if people have a guiding vision for their lives that might include a benevolent God, for example, it can help to meet what we call attachment needs, this need for security. So people might go to God like they would feel about a parent. And if you're feeling loved in that relationship, that can help provide a real sense of security. Also, there is, if you have a belief, a benevolent belief about what happens to us after we die, believing that there's going to be maybe a, a reincarnation where there's hope of a, another life to come or a belief of going to heaven or some other spirit realm where you just believe it's going to be better than here, that can be mm. profoundly comforting for people if they're fa facing death, uh, thinking about their own mortality or thinking about the loss of a loved one, for example. So those beliefs that the universe makes sense, that there's some order to it, maybe that there's some laws behind it that, that make it orderly can help. The benevolent God beliefs can help and those, and those afterlife beliefs too. And then people can also find just spiritual practices such as something like mindfulness, meditation, other forms of meditation, yoga, very centering. And those could also bring all kinds of mental and physical health hmm. benefits. Yeah. And, you know, you, you talk, your work is centered around spiritual struggles. So before we get into that, I, I'm just curious uh, this question might surprise you, but, um, you know, I was reviewing, uh, this, um, data from the Pew Research, which published in, uh, 2017. They had done a five year follow up. Maybe I'm not sure if the new data will be published, but, uh, it showed that, um, uh, you know, there's a big rise in SBNR community, which is spiritual, but not religious. And so the research showed that there's almost 27% of Americans identify themselves as SBNR. So in your, your opinion, um, is there any uh, implication of such trends or what are your thoughts about this switch to uh, identifying more as spiritual than religious? Yes, that's a big, big trend uh, in our culture. People exiting from religion altogether and then people preferring to identify as spiritual but not religious, even though the majority of people in the U.S. still identify as both religious and spiritual. So it's not as though 
the nation has completely changed, but there's definitely been trends toward uh, disenchantment with organized religion and people either deciding to become secular or deciding that they want to pursue their own personal private forms of spirituality rather than being part of an organized religious tradition. Mm. So that's an area of research that I'm somewhat involved with, uh, things having to do with people choosing to leave organized religion. And uh, there's a lot of other people doing great work in that area as well. So those trends are there and they definitely go along with spiritual struggles. You know, people will have struggles around religion in some way, and then they have to decide how they're going to respond to that crisis in their lives. Are they going to choose to kind of double down and stay in the tradition that they're in? Might they consider switching uh, religious communities or might they consider withdrawing uh, and deciding that, you know, I'm not going to believe in any of this stuff anymore mm. or I'm going to believe part of it, but I'm not going to attend services anymore. There's, there's all, all kinds of ways that people are pulling away from religion and people who are spiritual, but not religious show lots of spiritual struggles, just like, just like everybody else does. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, spiritual struggles are very common. Uh, even, even among uh, atheists and agnostics, we have some research on that. So but spiritual, but not religious people uh, often struggles around ultimate meaning uh, and then some interpersonal struggles around religion as well, deciding whether uh, to engage with faith communities or not based on all the issues they've had with faith communities. It's often a real challenge. And, you know, I also see, uh, so to your point, you know, the uh, in the same study, they showed that the religious and spiritual community uh, in America was 59% in 2012, but it dropped down 11 points to 48%. So it's not small, but it has significantly declined. And so, you know, I've had uh, Carol um, T uh, Tra Tarvis on, on the show as well, who studies cognitive dissonance. And I kind of, it just occurred to me that, you know, I'm a good person, but then I fail to do right by myself or by people. Uh, and that can be an, a very great source of uh, this internal struggle, right? Definitely. So is that also part of, so maybe can you define for us what is actual spiritual struggle? And does that apply to every human being or only uh, to people of faith? Or, and is it been studied in outside of the Christianity, which is a dominant religion in the U.S., right? Yeah, those are great questions. So spiritual struggles, or we sometimes call them religious and spiritual struggles, are any type of conflict or tension that a person is having around religion and spirituality. So it's a really, really broad category. So it includes things like uh, troubles around organized religion, so interpersonal struggles around religion, maybe having issues with what, pe with what people are doing in your religious community, or maybe you're not religious and how religious people are treating you or how they're behaving, anger at organized religion. So a lot of the, a lot of the struggles have to do with those interpersonal things. Some of them mm. have to do with more personal internal things like doubts about whether you believe the correct thing, questions about your moral compass or having trouble dealing with these, you know, having struggles around moral issues. Uh, in these questions of ultimate meaning, does my life actually have any meaning and struggling to find this deeper sense of meaning or purpose in life? And then we've got two categories that we call the, the supernatural struggles, which are the divine struggles, which is where you might be feeling angry at God, or if you don't believe in God, maybe anger around the idea of God, or feeling like maybe God has abandoned you or doesn't love you or maybe isn't there for you. And then we, finally, we've got demonic struggles, which is where people feel like there's they're being attacked or threatened or tempted by the devil or evil spirits oh, wow. or some kind of evil, evil force. So these these uh, struggles are really common in the U.S. population, you know, de depending on the, the study that we're looking at. Uh, well over half the population uh, are reporting spiritual struggles in, in some studies. It's if we're just looking at any type of spiritual struggle, often get around 70, 80 percent of people reporting some kind of spiritual struggles. And uh, we've looked at 
groups such as, uh, like I said, atheists and agnostics who don't tend to report the supernatural struggles, but certainly report the other ones. Uh, we've done studies among uh, Muslims and uh, Jewish people in Israel. There have been studies done in a, a, a variety of different countries. If I start listing them, then I'll, I'll miss one. Uh, and we and we did a study on anger at God or gods among uh, Hindu college students as well. So there have been quite a few studies done. Uh, there was one done on religious coping among Buddhists as well. But we're we're trying to get more into these cross cultural studies after just trying to build sort of a, a foundation in, with our convenient samples of people from the U.S., which is always where we have to start for financial reasons. <laughs> I see. So, wow. So first of all, I thought, um, and, and, you know, <laughs> as I'm listening to you, uh, so, some of the things that you just talked about, you know, I personally have had that. I grew up in India in a very, uh, you know, Hindu dominant uh, country. I'm, I guess the only country with <laughs> dominant population of Hindus, but um, one particular thing strikes uh, uh, with, me was hypocrisy. So can you talk a, a little bit about the role of hypocrisy in having spiritual crisis or having uh, concerns with people who are supposed to model some ideal behaviors <laughs> may not be showing so, but expect you to do the same. So is there some relationship between that, you know, our sense of justice versus noticing hypocrisy leading to spiritual crisis? Definitely. So I'm, I'm looking forward to going more in depth with some of these interpersonal struggles in, in our own work. Uh, but what I can speak to is there was some really important pioneering work done uh, in a book by Altemeyer and Hunsberger. This is like 30 years ago, looking at reasons why people have doubts about religion. And some of these concerns about things like religious hypocrisy, people, religious people seeming like they're supposed to be really good and holy, but then not, you know, living in the way that they're supposed to or expecting you to behave in certain ways and they're not doing it. Hypocrisy was a, a big one. And then mm. uh, it, issues of intolerance were also really major issues. And those are, these are huge reasons that today people are getting turned off from organized religion because they see examples of things that they see to be hypocritical or certainly intolerance of people, uh, a lot of the things around, you know, LGBTQ issues come to mind, people being afraid of outsiders, you know, this kind of, I'm not going to welcome people from other countries, I'm, I'm going to be afraid of strangers. Some of these types of things, people will look at religion and say, I thought these people were supposed to be acting in a loving way. What are they, what are they doing? Why are they treating people this way? And that people will definitely get turned off. So yes, hypocrisy really turns people off. We haven't gotten to look at it that much in our work, but it's, it's a big thing that is uh, a, a major reason that people will become disenchanted with religion. So maybe can you talk us a little, uh, talk a little bit about how you study this in a lab and how do you invoke uh, spiritual or experiences and uh, maybe share with us uh, some of your work that way? So our research is not primarily lab-based, so we don't try to invoke struggles for people usually. I'm not, I'm not primarily an experimental researcher, so we do more survey research. So we have a, a measure called the Religious and Spiritual Struggles Scale that has 26 items that, that has questions like I about the different domains I was just mentioning. So over the last month, to what extent have you <coughs> felt angry at God or had doubts about your religious or spiritual beliefs. And we just, we do a lot of questionnaire research and we would connect people's scores on the religious and spiritual struggle scale with their scores on other things. So, you know, they could, they could be attitudes toward other groups or they could be questions about your own mental health or how much you're thinking about leaving religion, how you view God, you know, all, we, we just try to connect a lot of different things. So, but our research is primarily survey oriented. Uh, I, I have done a few projects in the past where we had people like think of a time when they felt like God played some role in suffering. 
Hmm. And then had him like try to write a letter to God or something as kind of an experimental manipulation. So you could say we're kind of trying to get people to uh, get angry at God or think about what they might want to say to God. But in general, uh, our work isn't using those kinds of experimental methods. I feel like people are having enough spiritual struggles. I don't need to induce more. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah, it might get you uh, a little bit. A feeling bad about, you know, <laughs> treating your people in a poor ways as they think about their struggles and experience at the same time. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's always a place for great experimental work. It's just um, that hasn't been my primary area of of training or special skill. My experiments never work. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I do have a question about surveys. Um, how I'm sure you have some methods, but sometimes people don't have. Uh, access to what they they think they think, right? Yes. So is there some design in the way you um, evaluate surveys where people may think that way, but they may not actually act that way, or they may not even know what they think until they're asked? Um, how, does, uh, how do you as a researcher compensate for that? That's si- sidebar, by the way. <laughs> those, are, those are really challenging issues that every survey researcher has to deal with. Because people aren't always sure what they're thinking or feeling. And of course, people will be in a hurry when they're filling things out, or they might even be motivated to not talk about certain things. So, for example, in our work with anger at God, which is probably the thing that I've studied the most, a lot of people think that anger toward God is morally wrong. So they might be reluctant to report it on a questionnaire. So even though we've seen that about two thirds of people in the U.S., report that they've been angry at God, it's probably an underestimate. Sometimes you can get at those things more if you were doing something like interviewing somebody, or if you let people know ahead of time that a lot of people have felt angry at God. Uh, You you say that like right in the survey. Uh, How often have you felt this way? It kind of normalizes it. They used to do that in uh, sex research. They knew that people would be shy about talking about their sexual behavior. So they would talk about these behaviors as though they were really common and then just say, well, how often have you done this? Um, So we sometimes have to do things to make people feel safe bringing these things up. And sometimes we can get different information if we ask people to do something a little more open-ended, like maybe you didn't tell me that you were angry at God, but I'd like you to write a little note to God about how you feel about this situation where you were let down. And then we can go back and kind of look at what words they used and maybe rate how much negative emotion there seemed to be in there. There are ways like that that you can get around it. Other researchers might do things like have people think about some incident where uh, God might have been involved with some suffering and they might look at their blood pressure or something like that. Mm. Uh, So there's, I'm not a psychophysiological researcher, so I don't do that work, but there are, there are ways like that that you could find out, or you could maybe look at people's facial expressions when they're talking about it. And, and see if they, they're they saying that everything's fine, but they look like they're going to cry. Very hard to do that in a survey, obviously. <laughs> yes. So. Wow. So, um, you know, as can we talk a little bit about anger at God itself then? Um, sure. So we get angry when uh, the, we receive unfair treatment to say, right? Yes. Or we are misunderstood or misjudged. And... So when there's nobody to blame or no, when, for example, your house gets flooded, you can't really blame a person, but you can't blame the flood. So now you start looking at who is the larger entity operating this whole machinery, right? Yeah. So can you, um, and, and how did you even get interested in thinking about this? I got interested in, in studying anger at God because uh, this is back about 20 years ago, there was there was a growing body of research starting to suggest that religion is good for you. You know, if you are religious, you'll live longer. If you're religious, you'll be less depressed. And I felt like as somebody who had been raised um, in a very religious household, but had struggled around it, I felt like this struggle angle wasn't being captured. And at the time I was just getting into doing research on forgiveness, which was quite new uh, in terms of empirical research at the time. This is in the late nineties. But this, I I thought, well, what about when people get angry at God as opposed to another person? I wonder how much work has been done on that. So it was just an area that hadn't been studied very much. And uh, that's how I got into uh, doing work in that area. And 
what we find with that is that you might think that people would only get angry at God in response to things like natural disasters, like you're saying, where you couldn't possibly blame another person. And it is true. People will get sometimes angry at God in those situations. A lot of times with natural disasters, people are more likely to feel like God's punishing them. You know, God's punishing our country for not being faithful. Uh, but people will often get angry at God for things, even if another person is involved. So the people might get angry at God for atrocities that were committed during the Holocaust or, the, or for their partner leaving them or for a parent abusing them. In a lot of those cases, the logic is, well, God allowed this to happen rather than God actually um, caused it. And because people, it. people might feel like God can affect all kinds of events, it could even be small daily events that make people angry or, or frustrated with God. You know, anger is a strong word. A lot of people are going around kind of irritated or annoyed with God, you know, rather than <laughs> raging at God. And it could just be some little things like, you know, rain on your wedding day. Uh, I remember one of the, we had the study where we had people writing letters to God and one of the people who was most angry and was just raging and swearing at God in this letter <laughs> was somebody who had to come to our university uh, for undergrad when he wanted to go to MIT. So it, <laughs> so it doesn't take a catastrophe for somebody to get angry at God. Um, people can attribute all kinds of things to God. <laughs> Uh, but still, is there like a notion that there's uh, unseen, like, like you mentioned, you know, this God allowed this to happen. That means there's some something, some entity that's supervising fairness and justice in the world. And when I am a recipient of unfair, uh, undeserving unfairness, yes. then I turn to that source and say, what? <laughs> right. Yes. Great. I'm glad you reminded me of that. That theme of unfairness unfair suffering, uh, unfair things happening to you as an individual or to other people, the presence of evil in the world. Why is God allowing this? Or why did God cause certain things to happen? That sense of unfairness is what, as you said earlier, that's what often makes us angry at other people. And it's what tends to make people feel angry at God too. And sometimes there's also just, you know, like impatience. Why, why is this taking so long? Or hmm. why... Why, why is it, you know, I'm not sure that I can trust you to come through in this situation. So there's a variety of negative feelings like anger, mistrust, impatience, annoyance that, that often kind of get wrapped up together. And, you know, as, as I'm thinking about this undeserving unfairness uh, towards, uh, or I've been targeted <laughs> by God, uh, there's also um, kind of very, um, uh, at least from Hindu faith, I can say there's almost uh, some attitude of deservedness. I deserve uh, things to go well for me. And at least uh, in my faith practice, what we work every day on is, um, you know, because we are human beings, nothing is guaranteed. And to to think that there's some something you have done special or in some ways you are special is kind of not the right way to think about your life as a gift. <laughs> so, I'm, Do you I'm have so any thoughts glad. about that? Yes, yes. I'm so glad that you raised that because so when we looked at personality factors that predict somebody getting angry at God, the same thing that predicts a lot of other inner like anger between people is a huge predictor. It's called uh, psychological entitlement or yes. narcissistic <laughs> entitlement. So this sense yes. that I deserve better and things should go my way and it, it could easily translate into an idea that God owes me. So uh, yes. Josh Grubbs, who uh, used to work with me uh, and is now at Bowling Green, he did his dissertation on this idea of uh, divine entitlement, this idea that God owes me. And of course, wow. that's a huge predictor of, of anger at God. In, in general, people who go around with this sense of entitlement tend to be angry, unhappy people. So I'm really, really glad that you raised that. We, we've got quite a bit of literature on that point. <laughs> You know, it's it's uh, such an, uh, um, if you allow me to indulge, there's um, two concepts in, in Hindu daily practice, at least as part of my spiritual growth that I'm working on. It's called Guru Krupa and Guru Icha. So uh, Guru Krupa, Krupa means uh, 
uh, divine blessings. That's why it's happening. Whatever is happening to you, if it's favorable to your own desires, that's because of blessings. And Guru Icha means it is the will of God. So if something is not going per plan, that is the will of God so that something down the road doesn't go further away or, or, you know, haywire or maybe because something else may be in the, in the works that you are unaware of. So anything that comes that's not favorable, you just say, I accept. Anything that goes great, you say, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's wonderful. I mean, for people who believe in God, those kinds of strategies can be fantastic. We actually have a whole line of research now on gratitude to God that we're just getting started on. Wow. So that's something I'm, I'm really excited about. And the idea of something being God's will, sometimes people find that comforting and sometimes they don't. I think a lot of it has to do more with your view of God and whether you think that God is ultimately love or benevolent and has your best interests at heart, or if God is being kind of authoritarian or maybe mm. punishing and it's like my way or the highway, you know? So this idea of, of accepting things as God's will, that can work pretty well. If you, if you really feel like you can totally trust God and like God loves you, you love God, you're, then you're kind of willing to surrender that control and, and say, I, I trust you that this is going to work out for the best. And if people are able to do that, obviously these, that type of religious coping is, is going to help them stay close to God and it's going to help them feel better. But it's, if you impose that idea of it's all part of a bigger plan or it's God's will on people who are really hurting, say people who are bereaved, for example, it can be very wounding because when something bad happens, it might not be comf comforting to hear, oh, you know, I'm sorry that your daughter just died, but God needed another flower for his garden or something. You know, people will say things like this to bereaved people and it ends up being really unhelpful because it's like, well, why would God want, why, why is this part of God's plan? This makes God look cruel. Yes. So, so God's will is, is great if, if you're really feeling great about God. <laughs> You know, I've studied, um, um, you know, as a religious stu student of a religion, particularly Hindu religion, and also I'm familiar with Andrew Newberg's work, you know, uh, well, Abrahamic faith versus Eastern faith. So God is, uh, and I'm not very familiar, so I shouldn't be speaking confidently about that, but Abrahamic religion, God is portrayed as uh, with all power that may uh, have you may might be subjected to God's wrath as well as God's uh, blessings, but in the Eastern religion, uh, God is compassionate and God is uh, loving. Um, and is that something? Uh, how how does that fit with your research or your findings? We really want to do more work uh, within Eastern traditions, but the focus on compassion and connectedness is often, my, in my understanding, a big part of the Eastern traditions. But most faiths, when you get up to what we, sometimes I'm, I'm thinking of James Fowler here, who talked about these levels of spiritual development. When, when you get past this idea of just seeing God as being like a punishing parent or somebody who says you're in or you're out, and you're able to get to a, a level where you're thinking of God in a more of a way that involves this loving connection with ultimate reality and with each other, then most religions really start looking a lot the same. So on their more mystical mm. ends, you have Islam, Judaism, Christianity start looking a lot more similar to uh, what a lot of what we hear from the Eastern traditions where there's more open to, there's more openness to things like mystical experiences, often more belief in uh, a, a very connected afterlife, the idea that everything and everyone is connected and love is at the center. Uh, obviously people have had things like near-death experiences often really add to this literature. So there, there gets to be more of a focus on a, a consciousness that connects us and love connecting us. But, but for a lot of people who are in the monotheistic faiths, there can be this tendency to, uh, what we call anthropomorphize, meaning meaning that we see God as being maybe a little too human 
and tend to see God as just being like a parent or a judge or, you know, maybe like a random number generator or, or something, you know, you know, it could be, even if even seeing God as a friend could be kind of limiting. So when you're seeing God in this human way, it can seem more personal for better and for worse, because then you can project all your human positive and negative thoughts onto God. If you're seeing this as, as this relationship, and if you're seeing God in this more cosmic way, that's not as personal that might in some cases not give as many warm, warm fuzzies, but it might also lead to less of a sense that God is going to be angry at you or, or judge you. So we, we bring our psychologies, you know, our individual personalities into these situations and then try to integrate this with all that we're taught about God. And hopefully as we go through life, we'll be able to see things through a more and more connected viewpoint. That's, that's, the, the place that seems to, you know, that seems to do the best things for people. <laughs> it's a very long answer. Sorry. So, no, that's great. That's so great. So my question is, do we really need God to be directed to uh, behave in the most uh, righteous ways and uh, in, in ways to promote our own uh, selves to higher plane, uh, so to speak, uh, so that we not only, uh, or instead of selfish ways, we become uh, enlightened self-interest ways. Uh, well, can those who are atheists, can they accomplish that too? Absolutely. Uh, one of the arguments that I just strongly disagree with is this idea that you have to have a belief in God in order to be a moral and loving person. Uh, I think that for some people, their moral code comes from trying to follow God and they believe that God is loving. So that is very true for many people. But I believe that what you need to be a loving and moral person is to believe in, in love <laughs> and to believe in uh. the importance of, of caring for other people and for animals and for our, our planet and, and really relating in this loving way. And to the extent that we can really value others and ourselves so that we can like keep ourselves alive and not, you know, like take care of ourselves to the extent that we're able to orient our values in a direction that is benefiting others in a way that fits with our personality and our energy uh, and the, the things that we're good at doing. You know, I think that's a thriving human being. And for many people, they might see God as the source of this love that I'm talking about or God actually being this love that I'm talking about. But some people don't see it that way. And to say that you have to believe in God, especially if people have this image, you know, this anthropomorphic image of God, like I have to believe in the, uh, you know, this, this certain view of God, I have, I have to believe for Christians in the, you know, the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible God. I, I just don't think that it's realistic mm. to impose that on people. And I don't think either that a belief in God is going to guarantee that some, somebody's going to have good values. You know, people could believe in God and then just assume that God is on their side and God loves their group and hates other groups and is just going to send other people to hell. And, you know, God stuff can really, God beliefs can go very wrong. So if the God beliefs aren't pointing somebody toward love, <laughs> yes. I'm a little less excited about them. <laughs> I just love that you captured this essence of this way of being is, is, you know, to be most moral and loving person. Uh, God is a reflection of that. Then you can make use of God, but otherwise that can be itself be a guiding principle of life. So I don't want to, um, leave without talking about the most important parts of your work, which is, um, as you, uh, can people, um, first of all, this struggle that you talked about is, can feel very private, but your work shows that we need to not only, 
uh, address it, but we need to acknowledge it as a community. So can you talk a little bit about uh, what are the benefits of um, revealing these spiritual struggles uh, or disclosing them to others or even maybe building a dialogue around it? Um, how can that benefit us? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Well, being able to disclose, to, to tell somebody that you're having a spiritual struggle of any kind can be so valuable, but you do sometimes have to be careful with, with whom you share <laughs> because Sometimes, so we did a study on, again, just going back to anger at God, people who had had some anger at God and had told somebody about it. Most people said that they had gotten reasonably re supportive responses. The person said, you know, I felt that way sometimes too. Or they said that it was, it seemed reasonable to feel that way. They were understanding. But about half the people also got at least a little bit of a judging or disapproving response you know, feeling like maybe you shouldn't feel that way or feeling kind of like it wasn't acceptable or that they were going to be uh, criticized for disclosing that they felt anger at God. You know, basically that's, that's wrong. You shouldn't talk that way. And if people, to the extent that people got supportive responses, so if I'm angry at God and I tell you that I'm angry at God and you say, you know, I felt that way too, or a lot of people feel that way, people were actually more able to feel close to God after that and to feel like the struggle they were having had benefited oh, their wow. faith. But if they got that judgment or that sense of disapproval, they were more likely to try to suppress the anger, which we know, you know, cognitively is, it takes a lot of energy. They were more likely to stay angry. They were more likely to disengage from God completely, like walk away from the relationship. And they were more likely to abuse substances. So a, a big take home point there oh, is wow. um, you might tell somebody uh, that you're having a spiritual struggle. And if you get any kind of a shaming response, try to talk to someone else because you need to know that these struggles are extraordinarily common. Uh, even anger at God, which is one of the least socially acceptable struggles. We had this study where about two thirds of people said that they had sometimes felt that way. And remember that's probably an under report. So this is really common oh, wow. part of the human experience. So if I think my bigger, my bigger advice there, I mean, so finding somebody you can talk to is great and being honest with yourself that you're having the struggle is important. We do have research uh, mm. that Carmen Dworsky uh, first authored showing that if you're having a struggle, pushing it away, doing what we call experiential avoidance and not wanting to go there, not wanting to deal with it was associated with all kinds of anxiety, depression, stress. So it's, it's good to at least let yourself know that you're having a struggle, maybe journal about it, talk to yourself about it, try to talk to a safe person. But my bigger tip is if somebody tells you that they're having a struggle, please say something like, you know, I, I think that a lot of people feel that way, or I can understand how you might feel that way. Please don't make mm. them feel like it's bad to have the struggle because that really can be tough on people and can really cause them to retreat and feel shame around it, which then is just going to have, it's going to create other problems. So if somebody has the courage to tell you about your struggle, please just try to be there with them and accept them and show love to them in that moment. And you don't have to fix it. These are ultimate questions about reality. Nobody has the perfect answers for these things here. You don't have to give them some theological solution just express that you care and that you're listening. And that's going to be probably the best thing you can do. I love that message, you know, and uh, I work with uh, many uh, children, adolescent and adults with executive dysfunction. And I see this very applicable uh, to particularly parents who are trying to find reasons why this is happening to them. Uh, and, um, very few times this has come up, but parents have said, you know, I'm so upset, uh, with, with the, um, why is this happening to me? You know, why am I being punished? And, and so I can see this really, uh, creating a great uh, sense of acceptance, uh, that the struggle is not permanent and also, um, not, you are not the only one who struggles. Right? Yes, yes. And, 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 and for people who do believe in God, that belief that God is punishing you with negative events 
is common, but it also tends to be linked with more depression and anxiety. Uh, if for people who do believe in God to be able to think of what might be a broader meaning or how might God be trying to help me grow through this situation is at least emotionally going to be more productive than assuming that God is punishing you. Hmm. Well, I think this is so fantastic. So as we um, end this conversation, uh, one, one of the things I wanted to kind of say, uh, ask you is do people these days uh, believe in the devil? And particularly there's so much chaos that we experience every day. We hear news about unsavory behaviors of others. Um, how do you suggest that we, uh, you know, how might strong beliefs about demonic involvement pose problems in people's lives? I'm really excited to talk about this because it's not talked about enough. So not as many people believe in the devil or evil spirits as in God, but it's still the majority of the U.S. population uh, are going to hold some belief in the devil and in, and in hell. And sometimes these beliefs can work in a person's life. Uh, so let's say that you want to get angry at God. You don't want to get angry at God for something you can blame the devil. Sometimes believing that the devil is tempting us can can help to keep people on track. You know, I don't want to be tempted to drink. So if they think of the devil causing the temptation, it's kind of like they have an enemy to fight against. Mm. So I'm not trying to say that the those that the demonic beliefs are always problematic, but there's a lot of evidence that if people feel like the devil is tempting them, attacking them, uh, oppressing them, that that tends to be associated with a lot of emotional distress because it's, you feel like you're a, a victim, you know, being attacked. But I think the bigger thing is when we start to see the devil operating through other people, and this is a, a really dangerous problem. So, uh, and it's something that we see today uh, with, for example, the QAnon uh, belief system that uh, is out there, this idea that people are worshiping the devil, uh, having, you know, going through satanic rituals, maybe people, it, it'd be very easy to say something like, oh, people who disagree with me politically are actually under the devil's control. And these beliefs are actually very common in the U.S. today. And the real danger here is that if you start to believe that somebody else is following the devil, <laughs> worshiping the devil, or even if, even if they're not worshiping, that, that they're under the devil's influence, it's very easy to dehumanize those people and to start to see them as mortal enemies and maybe even go to the level of, of well, I'm, you know, I don't like them, but maybe, maybe have prejudice against them. In some cases, I know I'm talking really extreme here, but maybe if you really think that these people are basically just instruments of the devil, you might feel like they, you have every right to destroy them and that that would be the morally good thing to do. So you want to talk about some dangerous beliefs, this belief that the devil is coming in and speaking through and working through people that you happen to disagree with, I think is extraordinarily dangerous. Whereas just thinking, oh, the devil's tempting me to, uh, to lie or to harm someone, that type of belief might end up helping some people with their self-regulation. I know that was an intense. You know, it's thing so to interesting. Say. Until <laughs> no, no, this is so. Um, honestly, uh, I had not thought about uh, that way of framing things until I read your work, and then also have heard you speak. And uh, it's so interesting. It's the highest form of the othering. You know, it's just yes. how we make people believe that they are so different from us. That and so unacceptably different that um, treating them or dehumanizing them is the right way to be because it's activating your um, righteous anger and yes. nothing <laughs> potent than righteous anger, right? Well, not only righteous anger, but talk uh, about talk about profound disconnection. How could we alienate ourselves from each other more than to assume that other people are instruments of evil? Wow. That is too much. 
Well, Julie, this has been nothing but fantastic conversation. You have given not only um, guidelines for us to think about a role of, uh, you know, divine presence in our lives, but also it having such an influential uh, uh, role um, or it, it can steer us um, <laughs> to uh, in the direction where we can do right by ourselves and others. Uh, as we end this uh, discussion, uh, would you mind sharing with our audience uh, what are some of uh, the readings that have influenced your thought process? Uh, can you recommend some books for us? Sure. Uh, one that I have been looking at a lot recently uh, is by Whitehead and Perry, uh, Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry, uh, called uh, Taking America Back for God. Uh, it It gets at the issue of Christian nationalism in the United States and how these beliefs that God is on our side and that our, our country is supposed to be better than other countries and set up to be following God and that we have to make sure we're following God. If people aren't careful, those beliefs can feed into a lot of these interpersonal problems of uh, being afraid of outsiders uh, sometimes some prejudice, sometimes some judgmental attitudes. Uh, that's one. Uh, another one uh, that has really affected me lately is by uh, Bruce Grayson from the University of Virginia called AFTER. He's really the world's pioneering researcher of near-death experiences. This is a combination of a research review and wonderfully wow. written memoir all about near-death experiences and their implications for how we understand uh, the afterlife, consciousness, each other. It's, it's just fantastic. Wow. Uh, and then there's a book, Universal Christ by Richard Rohr. So for people who are coming from the Christian tradition, but struggle with this anthropomorphic view of God and wonder if there's a way to think more about God in terms of universal love within Christianity, that book is one entry point. There's a variety of good books, but that's one entry point into that conversation. Well, all right. That's all the time we have today. Thank you again, Julie, for being our guest here today, uh, sharing your wisdom and really, really uh, showing a, a side of our human experience that is not a commonplace uh, discussion when we think about raising children, being effective human beings, and creating communities where we can all belong with peace and joy, but most importantly, love in our hearts. Uh, as you can see, everyone, uh, these are important conversations we are having with our knowledgeable and incredibly qualified and passionate experts with unique perspectives on executive function. Um, so please stay in touch. If you love what you're listening, share with uh, your friends and colleagues. And definitely, if you have a moment, uh, leave us a uh, review. Uh, once again, thank you for joining uh, everybody on this episode of Full Prefrontal. And until next, stay well, be well. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function. To contact your host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive function, visit her website at exqinfinitenowhow.com. That's www.exqinfinitenowhow.com. Tune in next week for another informative episode of Full Prefrontal, hosted by the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath.